texted about it, but I wanted to make sure. You're good? Okay. <clears throat> if you guys want to open to Hebrews 7, um, that's where we'll begin. I suspect this is a very uh, well-known teaching that we're going through. There's, there's nothing earth-shattering here. I'm going to move out of the light of that thing a little bit. <clears throat> um, I'm, I'm sure you've heard uh, people say things like this. Um, well, what's really the right interpretation? Uh, or, more uh, accusingly, well, that's just your interpretation. Um, and then more passively, well, you know, there are many possible interpretations. Um, so you've probably heard that. You may have even said those things. I have. I've said those things. Um, <clears throat> and I, I know why I said them. Uh, I was lazy. I didn't really care to figure out the real interpretation. Uh, that may not be the only reason. Um, some people may actually believe that. Um, and there are, that, that, is, that is true about some things, not about the Bible. Um, because un, un, unless people tell us how to interpret their communication, right, we don't really know how to interpret it. Um, so we'll, I'll use myself as an example. If I, if I say to you, let's go to the match, and that's all I say, let's go to the match. Well, if I don't tell you how to interpret that, right, you, you, you understand it. It's in English, and you understand English, right, but you still have to interpret it. Um, so I'll tell you, here, here's my interpretation when I say let's go to the match, right? And this may surprise you, it may not, but it's not going to be your interpretation, all right? Okay, here's my interpretation. First, we will arrive 15 minutes prior to gates opening, which is two hours before kickoff. Second, we will proceed to my seat so we can get our hands stamped by the nice ladies who stamp your, stamp your hands so that we don't have to deal the the ticket thing, we just show our hand the next time we come in, right? We're doing all this, it's groundwork. Get it out of the way, right? We'll stake out our place in the Delta Club so we can um, welcome the team when they get there, maybe get some selfies, right, with the players. This is all, you know, the game hasn't started. We're gonna grab some food, walk around the stadium, maybe get a scarf, right, just chill. During the game, we'll lose our voices. We will lose our voices. If you don't lose your voice, you didn't go to the match. You see, you see how the interpretation works, right? Um, finally, we'll go downstairs after the match to see off the team, off the field, whether they win or lose. We'll go see the team. Um, I've learned over the years that not everyone has my interpretation of let's go to the match, right? Uh, on the other extreme, there are some people, when I say let's go to the match, the way they interpret that is I'll text you when I arrive at some point during which soccer is already being played in the stadium. And, I mean, that's, that's, that's like how they envision going to the match. Like, my timeline as a human intersects the timeline of the match at some point, and then we pass through and we diverge, and I was at the match, Right? But there was no discussion. There was no discussion ahead of time or, or anything where we had to clarify that. It was just two different interpretations of the same goal. Let's go to the match. Right? Well, I mean, fortunately, right, our, our eternal destinies don't depend on having the same interpretation of let's go to the match. Right? I don't have to, you don't have to know exactly what I mean when I say that. And you don't have to abide by my interpretation of it. And you're still at the match, right? You can still enjoy the soccer. Um, so how do we interpret the Bible if we can't even get something this simple? We can't even be on the same page <laughs> about going to the match, right? Like if I tried to enforce this, there would be like upheaval, right? I mean, 70,000 people all getting there two hours before the kickoff. That's, that's not a good idea, right? I mean, that's why you have the gates open two hours ahead, so that people can trickle in, because everyone has a different interpretation of let's go to the match, right? It's a good thing. It's 
So how do we do this with the Bible? Um, with something that's actually th- that matters, right? That we that we have the same interpretation. So we're going to look at an example here in Hebrews chapter seven. Um, <clears throat> I don't like the term "silence of the scriptures." Um, I understand why it's used, and I understand that rebranding that is never going to happen, um, because the, sil- the the scriptures are silent about five guys, right? Scriptures are silent about airplanes. Um, they're, they're silent about clocks. <laughs> you, right? I mean, the scriptures are silent about all kinds of things. And it has no meaning whatsoever. But the term is used because of the silence of the scriptures in the presence of the scriptures speaking something. And that's what we're going to see in, in chapter 7. Um, so let's just read a few verses. I mean, I'm taking these out of context because we're not, we're not studying the context of Melchizedek. We're not looking at the high priest uh, or the, the, the priesthood that Jesus is, is in right now. We're looking at a principle that's taught in the midst of that. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 11 through 14. Now, if perfection was through the Levitical priesthood, for on the basis of it, the people received the law, what further need was there for another priest to arise according to the order of Melchizedek And not be designated according to the order of Aaron. For when the priesthood is changed, of necessity there takes place a change of law also. For the one concerning whom these things are spoken belongs to another tribe from which no one has officiated at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord is descended from Judah, a tribe with reference to which Moses spoke nothing concerning priests. All right, th- I mean, this sounds, it's all tangled up. He's, 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 kind of, he's obviously making a very, uh, an argument here. But the argument goes back to chapter 3 when he, he, he introduced the idea of, hey, there's a, there's, a, there's a new high priest. Jesus is that high priest. In chapter 4, in chapter 5, he's making the case. And in chapter 5, he, he introduces Melchizedek. And he says, okay, you know, this is kind of the priesthood. And then he stops. And he's like, okay, you know, you guys, you're hard of hearing. So you're not going to understand this. And then he spends chapter 6 explaining the dangers of their immaturity. And then in chapter 7, he gets back to Melchizedek. So, so we're in the midst of a very long kind of, when I say argument, I don't mean a fight. I mean, he's building a case, right? And, and he's saying here, in, in this section, he's saying um, there are some repercussions to this fact that Jesus is high priest. You can't just, you, you can't just go around saying, oh, I'm a high priest. You know what? I like that guy. That guy's a high priest. I don't care if he's from Levi. Right? That's the point that he's making. You can't, you can't do that. And, and, and it's not because, like, I don't have the authority. I mean, that's part of it. But it's because, like, God chooses his high priest, and he set an order in. And so if somebody else wants to be a high priest, well, they don't get to be a high priest. It doesn't matter what you call yourself. It doesn't matter how many people vote for you. You're not high priest, Right? And that was kind of the crux of the whole Roman system. The Romans appointed the high priest. Well, who knows who what the, the actual high priest was, right? So the, the actual changing of the priesthood isn't our focus, though. We're going to take this passage out of context and look at this, this small piece. And the crux of that, the thing, the principle we're looking at is found in verse 14. It is evident that our Lord was descended from Judah... This is the part that I'm I'm focusing on. A tribe with reference to which Moses spoke nothing concerning priests. There's no way to overemphasize what we're reading here. This is God interpreting his own word for us in text and recording it. Here's what I mean when I say something. I mean I exclude all other options. That's what I mean. Um, if you need to understand, when I say something, if I, it, it, you know, right, I'm speaking as if I was God. If I was to say something about five guys, burgers, now you would know how to interpret that. Because I've given you an example here of what I meant when I said this thing about excluding everyone else 
from the priesthood by, only, by not mentioning them. He also didn't say Amorites couldn't be priests. What he said was Le Levites are priests. That's what he said, right? <clears throat> so this is huge for two reasons. One is we don't have to argue with each other about how to approach a scripture. There's no reason to argue over interpretation. We know how to interpret the scripture. My interpretation doesn't matter. Right? I mean, that's nice. We, kn we now know how to approach scripture together. But second, it means that he demands we approach his word his way. Like he, he's now set out an expectation. He, did, he didn't just you know, give all the laws and the commandments. Now he's going back and he's, he's, he said, all right, let's take a look at this commandment here, and I'm going to tell you exactly what it meant. Like I'm going to unpack it. Right? It, meant, it meant this. And so now because we know that, now we're responsible to him to actually approach his word the way he, the way he intended it. Because if, if he didn't tell us his interpretation, we might sit back and say, well... You know, I'm, maybe we can appoint a high priest from Levi and Judah. The high priest is still from Levi, but there's also one from Judah. Law satisfied, right? I mean, it would be. If we didn't have this, well, there, there are other examples, okay? But if we didn't have God telling us how to interpret his word, I mean, it would be totally fair to say, well, we're going to have high priests from every tribe. But Levi has to be there. And then that satisfies the law. Well, we can't do that. You see that here, right? So I don't know exactly the technical term for this, okay? Uh, I call it strict interpretation as opposed to loose interpretation. Um, doesn't mean it's not strict in like, oh, that's burdensome or that's bad. Or you know, when I hear strict, right, I think parents and police and, you know, jail, right? I mean, it's ne negative connotation, right? Well, I, I'm not trying to bring out a negative connotation. What I'm, I'm trying to say is, like, when God, when God makes a positive statement, priests come from Levi, high priests come through Aaron, right? Those are positive statements. Strict interpretation means he excludes every other possibility, including Judah, right? The people of God, you know, they're Israelites. They can't be priests or high priests. He, not because he went through and said, oh, and by the way, you know, no Reuben, no Simeon, no Levi, you know, no Dan. I'm sorry, not no, no Levi. Um, uh, no Dan, no Gad, no, right? Only Levi and Aaron. Well, he didn't have to do that. And the reason he didn't have to is he's explaining to us, this is what I meant, right? I know this is very, very simplistic, but it's incredibly powerful because it doesn't just apply to Hebrews 7. <laughs> it applies to every single positive statement God has made, ever, right? Well, I mean, the law's been done away. We can't go back and say the law still binds. I'm not saying that. But if you want to go back and, and interpret the law for the Israelites who are living under it, that's... That's the interpretation they would have had to use, right? Okay, so in, again, back to our example in Hebrews 7, what, you know, what does this mean, right? Okay, so if you look at the case the writer is making in these, these few verses, okay, another priest has been named. Jesus has been named as, as high priest. He's not a Levite. This means the priesthood has changed entirely which means the law has changed entirely. Right? He starts off with just one assertion. There's a new high priest. And in that, he, he, he makes the case because of strict interpretation. There is no power in the law anymore. It's not effective. This all seems logical, right? Um, it all seems logical until you try um, to apply a loose interpretation to the Mosaic law, right? A loose interpretation would permit priests from Judah in addition to priests from Levi because priests from Judah are not specifically banned or condemned. That's loose interpretation. 
and that's not wrong. It's wrong to use in the Bible now, right, because we see God uses strict. But loose interpretation is how you interpreted my let's go to the match. And that's because I didn't provide a, con a construct for you to use, a paradigm for you to use to interpret. We do strict interpretation and loose interpretation 500,000 times a day. We don't think about it because we don't have to, right? If we know somebody is a very strict thinking person, we do strict interpretation with them. It's based on what we know about them. If somebody's loose, we're like, okay, yeah, right. Well, that just means like you'll be there when you're there or whatever, right? And it's not a good or it's not a moral thing, right? It's how you live. It's how humans communicate, <laughs> right? Um, but it's also how God communicates, right? And so a loose interpretation applied to the Mosaic law would say, oh, look, God did not ban Judah. Oh, joy. Judah can be a, a high priest. That's loose interpretation. Hebrews 7 says there is no loose interpretation with God's commands. That's really massive. That means that God... And now, now, now you kind of understand where the silence of the scriptures term comes from, right? It, it's not. It's not that the scriptures are totally silent on a subject. Actually, there's there's almost no power in that. It's it's complete freedom at that point, right? That's why I fly on airplanes. God doesn't say one thing or another about how I should travel internationally, right? Um. It's, it's the silence in the context of a positive statement. Right? Once God says priests come from Levi, high priests come through Aaron, he doesn't have to say any more on that subject. It's done. Right? He doesn't have to tick off every descendant of Jacob and, and ban them. Right? So now we have a tool. Right, this is. I mean, this is not the only tool you use in interpreting scripture. This is a single. This is a single tool, right? Um, that we can use to approach everything that God has said. Um, what gives this paradigm power is the is the coupling of it with what God has communicated, as well as His silence about alternatives, not just His mere silence, right? There's an Old Testament example of this as well that, that's interesting. Um, in 2 Samuel chapter 7, um, also I think 1 Chronicles 17, but 2 Samuel 7 uh, is the, are the notes that I have. David wanted to build a house for God, um, which seems like a great idea. Um you know, he looks at his house, and he's like, man, I've got a really nice house. And then he looks at the tabernacle, and he's like, man, that's a tent. God's, God's ark is in a tent, and I'm in, an, I'm in a house. Uh, I'm going to do something about that. And so he, well, well let's just read this text. Second Samuel uh, chapter 7, verses 1 through 6. Now it came to pass when the king was dwelling in his house, this is David, and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies all around, that the king said to Nathan the prophet, you see he's going to the right source, he goes to the prophet, said to Nathan the prophet, see now I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells in tent curtains. Then Nathan said to the king, go do all that is in your heart, for the Lord is with you. But it happened that night that the word of the Lord came to Nathan, saying, go and tell my servant David. Thus says the Lord, would you build a house for me to dwell in? For I have not dwelt in a house since the time that I brought the children of Israel from Egypt, even to this day, but have moved about in a tent and in a tabernacle. I, I hope that after this painful going through of Hebrews 7, like that this is plain now, right? It's exactly the same principle. God's like, I already spoke. I already, I already said where I would reside. I would reside in a tent, right? Um, if you drop down to verse 12 and 13, um, 
When your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you who will come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Well, what's going on here? What is going on here? David wants to build a house for God. He wants to build a temple for the, for the ark. God says, hey, I already spoke. I have always been in a tabernacle. So you, you, you don't get to do this. And then, and then in verse 13, he's like, your, your son will build a house for my name. Well, okay, so does strict interpretation work or not? Well, yes, it does, because verse 13 is new information, people. If God was to come down and walk in here and say, oh, you know that verse over in Matthew? Well, I want to change that up. Well, he's got every right to do that. Now we have new information in that verse in Matthew. It gets changed up, right? God is revealing new information in verses 12 and 13 that says, oh, now I'm speaking again about where I'm going to dwell, and I am going to dwell in a temple. He's not undoing strict interpretation. I hope you guys are able to see that. There's, an, there's another example of that very thing in 2 Chronicles 29. Um, this, this, this was something I struggled with mightily. Um, coming out of denominations, right? We had instruments. And I mean, I liked them. I liked organs. I liked pianos, right? And I still like them. I mean, I don't like them in worship, but my ear likes them. What little bit of ear I have left. Well, so, you know, I'm, I'm going to these churches now, and there's no instruments. And I'm like, man, this isn't cool. I don't have a good voice. Most of these people around me don't have good voices. You know, where's, where's the piano to kind of drown these people out, right? Or where's the piano just to keep us on tune, on, on key, sorry, key, right? Well, look at Second Chronicles uh, chapter 29, verse 25, talking about the reinstitution of worship in the temple, right? Trying to get things sorted out, get things back to where they're supposed to be. I th uh, this is Hezekiah, I believe, because uh, I only have the one verse. And he stationed the Levites in the house of the Lord, with cymbals, with stringed instruments, with harps, according to the commandment of David, of Gad the king's seer, and of Nathan the prophet. For thus was the commandment of the Lord by his prophets. Well, the reason I struggled so mightily was because you could never find any of these things in the law of Moses. If you go back to the law of Moses and you look for instruments, the only instruments you find are like these silver trumpets that the priests were supposed to blow on certain times. Right? They weren't supposed to play jazz on them. Right? It wasn't a satchmo trumpet. So, so people would constantly tell me, right? Well, Richard, David had the freedom to change up the temple worship. None of that's in the law. David just did what he thought was good. No, he didn't. <laughs> right here, the, it came through David and Gad and Nathan, for thus was the commandment of the Lord by his prophets. You will put instruments in my temple worship. Well, then, okay, now it's, it's actually illegal to refuse that. Do you see how that's new information coming after the law? God has the authority to do whatever he wants to do when he wants to do it, right? That doesn't undo strict interpretation because now putting stringed instruments in temple worship is part of the strict interpretation. You see, the, the principle of the strict interpretation doesn't change. The, the principle flows all the way through. It's when God introduces new information, right, that the manifestation changes. Right? In Exodus, God says, tabernacle. Well, then, okay, so the manifestation of strict interpretation is the people build a tabernacle. That's how it, that's how it manifests itself. Well, then he comes in hundreds of years later, and he says, temple. Well, strict interpretation demands that you now build a temple and you have worship at the temple. Right? And he comes in and he says instruments. Strict interpretation demands they have instruments as part of their worship. Now, 
I hope this sounds as simple and as boring to you as it does to me, because this is about as straightforward and as simple a lesson as you, as you get out of the Bible, right? But the tool is incredibly powerful. And the reason I wanted to go through it is because, well, one, for, for me, I would say for years, when I heard the term silence of the scriptures, I just tuned out because I, I literally thought people were talking about things that God was completely silent about. And I'm like, I don't, why, why, why do I need to hear about this? And then when I understood the teaching that was tied with it, I was like, well, that's a terrible name. Like, why, why would you call something like that silence of the scriptures when the scriptures aren't silent? They're not silent about the priesthood. They're not silent about the temple or the tabernacle, right? I mean, I understand it. Like, I'm not saying I don't get it. I'm saying as a young Christian, I was hearing these things, and I'm like, this is absurd. And then as I matured, other people outside the church would come to me and say, yeah, this guy was talking about silence of the scriptures, and the scriptures are silent about all kinds of stuff. Are you guys saying I can't eat a hamburger because there's no hamburgers in the Bible? You know, I mean, they're, they're just being cynical. They're not really interested, but in, in general, right, they, they didn't understand. So my hope is, right, not that we can rebrand it. It's always going to be called Silence of the Scriptures. That's just what it's going to be called, at least where we are in the world. That's what it's called, okay? But what we can do is we can be better prepared to help people around us in the church, right, and, and outside understand, okay, well, and not, not just, you know, Hebrews 7, but let's say somebody has a question about any kind of command, right? Like, okay, well, why do we sing? Or why do we only sing? Or, you know, what, what, whatever. Well, okay, go to a scripture that talks about singing and say, okay, do you, understand, do you understand strict interpretation? Do you understand how we should interpret this, right? Because if, if you take someone alongside with you to, to scripture, and you both read it, and you both do not have the strict interpretation, well, you just wasted 15 minutes or 30 minutes of your life you'll never get back. Right? you got to start with, one, the Bible's from God, but two, God demands strict interpretation. If you don't agree on that, you guys are just going to sit there and argue semantics all day. It's not going to get anywhere. So hopefully this is something where you can say, okay, let's start with this is from God, and let's start with strict interpretation. And now let's see, okay, he spoke, he said, sing. Well, does that allow other things to happen at the same time that you're singing? No. There can't be anything else making noise when you're singing because God said sing. That's strict interpretation, right? I mean, that's just another example, right? But I, I hope that's a tool that can help you guys. Um, and I, again, I know, already know you know it. I'm doing a Peter thing where I'm just reminding you of something you already know. Um, but hopefully to maybe look for an opportunity of somebody who's confused about something um, to be able to take them through the same thing. So that's all I had for today. Appreciate um, your time um, for letting me speak. Are we gonna have? We're gonna have a song first, and then we'll have a.